Amen. Thank you, John. Good morning. So uh, a couple things before we get started. First of all, if, the, if you're new here, I'm Pastor Tracy. I'm the administrative pastor at the church and part of the teaching team. And so I'm blessed to be able to teach uh, you today. I was going to come last week. Thankful Dwayne came. I think it was, if you were here last week, was that not a godsend? Did God not speak through Dwayne last night of the week? Amen, he did. And so God's plans, not my plans. I, I want to ask something of you. First of all, you'll notice in this church we don't really put a lot of scripture on the screen, and here's the reason that I don't want it up there today, because you're going to see in this message what God is calling us to is to be more involved in this Bible that we have. You may have a physical Bible, you may have an app, I don't care, it, it, whatever works for you, but you need to have a Bible in your hands, and if you do not have a Bible in your hands, on either side of the sanctuary there is a bookcase, and there's a Bible there, you need to have one. If you don't own a Bible, take it home with you, it's yours, okay? And another thing that I want you to do is we're going to hit quite a few places in Scripture today, and so... I think it's important that we just come to church. We don't just come there and just sit. We're going to talk about that as well. But we come invested in what is God is, is saying today. What is God saying today? And I want you to invest in it even a little bit further today because I may move fast enough you may not be able to get there. So I want you to dig through your belongings, see if you find a pen and a piece of paper. And if you don't have a pen and a piece of paper to write these down, on the sound booth wall back there, there's some paper stacked up. There's some pens. Borrow one from your, uh, your neighbor if they have one. Write these down and then later go and visit them in Scripture. And you should do that every week, really. Amen? What if I'm teaching something that's not biblical? How are you going to know it unless you invest in it, unless you read it? Amen? So make sure you do those things. I want to start out, we're going to start out, and I'll, I'll read these off and give you a little bit of time. Uh, for a Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. You can flip there in your Bibles. I don't hear a lot of pages, so hopefully there's a lot of apps. I don't see a lot of flashing. Everybody needs to turn there. Second Peter chapter 1. Say amen when you're there. All right, 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3 of chapter 1, it says this, His divine power has given us everything that we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises. Amen. We hold that in our hands right now. So that through them we may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world because, uh, caused by evil desires. Now pay attention. For this very reason, make every effort. Get your pen out, right? Under, put, a, put a line underneath that. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection and love. And then here's another underlined part here. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, do a double line under increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind. Nearsighted and blind to what? Forgetting that they have even been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make Make every effort, another line there, to confirm your calling and election for if, if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can I preach this morning? Um, I have a, a concern that I've had for a time about the church. I talk to other pastors around the country, and some of them have the same concern, but I can't preach to that, those churches. I can only preach to this one this morning. And I believe that the church has gotten stagnant. Well, I hear some, some, that's good. It's good to hear that. I believe that the church has become stagnant. This may be painful. I believe this church has become a bit stagnant. What is stagnancy? Stagnant means as a, as a body of water that's confined in a confined space. It has no current, has no flow. It often has a very unpleasant smell as a consequence. Stink, sluggish, motionless, and inactive. As a good shepherd I, in this church, and I love this church, to, you don't know how much. You, you guys are my life. Uh, and, and I love this church, so as a good shepherd, I have to look at the flock 
I have to assess where things are at from time to time, and I have to address those things. And that's what God is telling me to do, is to address a condition that he has shown me that he is seeing in the flock today. It may not be all of you may be sitting there going, I'm not stagnant. Okay, that's great. But please pay attention because somebody sitting right next to you might be. So it might be an accurate description of some of the people's Christian walk right now. Some people are not living. They're simply existing. Going through the motions. Amen? They're not engaging. They're not bettering themselves or anyone else around them. They're not doing anything with this new life that God gave you. That's a description of what stagnation can be. Now, here's the thing. You can come to church every time there's a service, and you can be stagnant. You can... You can Come down to the altar during service, which I encourage you to do if the Holy Spirit is, is, is convicting you. But you can get up from there and still be stagnant. You can be convicted in your seats, and I love to sit, uh, those of us who get to sit at the back as we kind of take care of things in the service, I see the conviction on people, and they're down, they're praying, but you can be convicted and still do nothing with what God's given you. And I believe that we are in that place today. So first thing we need to look at is what can cause us to be stagnant. And I, and I really truly want you to be questioning yourself as we move through this study. I'm going to hit a lot of verses, but it's in God's word. There are, there, are, there are warnings. There are things that could happen if we don't come out of this stagnant state. And there are things that can happen if we do. I can tell you that over the last year, I have prayed diligently for God to give me dreams and visions. Do you pray for that? You should. You should. And he has given me dreams. Dreams I haven't necessarily shared with anybody because a lot of those dreams have been for me. But I've also seen this church alive in a way that it has not ever been. I have seen this church reaching out into this community around us in a way we have never done before. So either God's saying, this is where we can be if, you'll, if we'll change things, or maybe he's just, I mean, he's not given to me those for no reason. And he's also given me dreams as a warning. I had one last night. I have to share with you before I go forward. Uh, this is going to sound a little strange, but when I woke up, I, I knew it was a part of what we're going to talk about today. I, I can't describe exactly where I was at, but we were, I was with, a, with people, and we were being attacked by, this is the part you're going to laugh at, we're being attacked by bears, lots of different bears. They were coming from everywhere in every different direction, but part of that dream and vision was the church was together, and we were standing against them. We found a way to fight them off and to defeat them from their attacks. And I woke up going, okay, what did I eat? There. They were being attacked, and, and, but as we stood together against the attack, the onslaught that was coming at us, we were able to defeat the attacks. But we all had to be prepared and use the weapons that we had and the talents and the gifts that we had to be able to stand against them. That's what the church should be, amen? So what can cause us to get in that place? What can cause us to get in that place where we are, we are stagnant, where we're not living out our faith? The first thing that can happen is, that we, is, is just laziness. Come on. I, I think that it, it, just, it brings us down to that I just don't want to do it. I don't want to put the effort in. Just, just laziness. I think the pandemic played into this a little bit. A little bit. We can't blame it on. It, it's about choice. We can't blame it on something else around us. Amen. But, but I think the pandemic did play into that, kind of pulled us back from everybody, kept us from interacting with one another, uh, told us we need to keep our mouths shut, keep our mouth, our face covered. And I think that did play a little bit into it, but I saw it even before the pandemic. We, we live in a society with modern conveniences that does kind of make us lazy, doesn't it? Don't have to get up for the remote. How many of you remember having to get up to change the channel? Yeah, uh, 
and then dial that thing in because it was all fuzzy. Don't have to do that anymore. We can just sit in our Lazy Boy and, and change the channel. We don't have to even, man, anymore. We can have things automated throughout our house. We can tell Alexa to turn on certain lights and turn off certain things. And we don't even have to act. act. We have AI that's becoming, artificial intelligence is becoming very uh, relevant in our society, which even does more than write entire papers without ever doing your study or work. I suppose you could probably write a sermon. I didn't do it with this, by the way, just so we know. And did you know, side note, did you hear that they're trying to get AI to rewrite Scripture so it's more, it's, it's more, it, it doesn't, it's not as painful. It doesn't hurt people's feelings. I want Scripture to hurt my feelings, amen? Everything automated, and we can come to a place where we just don't put in the effort to do it. Now, there's a difference between being tired and being lazy. Everybody needs rest, amen? Everybody needs a vacation. Everybody needs to be able to do those things. But that, that's in life and getting rest, but not in our faith. We need balance in our life. We can take time to rest, but we also can use it as an excuse to get too comfortable. And I don't want to get comfortable. So the first thing that can cause uh, stagnation in our faith and in our church, because understand, who's the church? Raise your hand if you're the church. You're the church. Okay, so if the church is, is stagnant, it's because individuals are in that place. So laziness can cause stagnation. The second thing can be apathy. You can bring that back up if you want. Apathy. That not now, laziness says that I, I don't want to do it, but apathy says, I don't care. Where's that? There it is. I don't care. That, that's a dangerous place to be. And you can be here this morning and have an attitude of, I don't care. I don't need to do it. The guy standing up front's doing it. That's all I really need. I don't need, I don't have a, a, a desire. Oh, there we go. We're back. We're back. I can be more animated with my hands. Thank you. <laughs> when, I lay, when I'm lazy, I care about something, but I don't put forth the effort. It's not a priority, but when I'm apathetic, I could care less whether something is done or not. It's not important to me. Nothing inspires me. I'm not enthusiastic about the things of the Spirit. There's no excitement and there's no passion. If you saw, I put a video out a while back about that because the Lord was really speaking to me about this lack of passion and excitement in our faith and, and in our churches that we're just not showing it or, or in society or, you know, there's people that I, I know who are believers and when they're out in the world, I don't hear anything from them about their faith. Here's an example. You call yourself a Christian? Look back on your social media feeds. You mention God in there at all? Mm. I can become indifferent and complacent. No excitement, no passion. So apathy can bring about stagnation. I think laziness leads into apathy, and that can get us in a very bad place where we just don't care to do it. What else can lead to um, stagnation in our life? Doubt. I see that a lot in people today. Maybe it's something you struggle with. It can come from our past. It can come from things that we've, we've been through before. Can I tell you what it is? It's a lie of Satan. Doubt is a lie of Satan. Do you know why? Because the things that you need to do, you do not do by your own power. You do them by the power of God. He's given you the power and the strength to do those things. So when you're doubting yourself, you're actually doubting that God can give you the ability to do something or to step up and use your talents and your gifts. Can I tell you, that's uh, what I'm talking about here is not only being in the word and not only being in prayer, because those are two are vital, amen? amen? I think Spurgeon, they asked Spurgeon one time, I heard that he said, what's, what, what's more important, Bible study or prayer? And he said, well, what's, what's more important to you? Inhaling or exhaling? Because that's what it is, right? But I'm also talking about being leading of the Holy Spirit, seeking that. Because some of you, if I asked you, you know you're saved, you remember that time, but you cannot say that you have heard anything from the Holy Spirit. But my Bible tells me that once you come to salvation, you have that access, right? I do a lot of counseling here in the church, and a lot of people come to me, and they say, well, what should I do? I'm not going to tell you. I'm not. Sometimes it can seem very right there in front of us. But what God's saying is, is draw close to me. I'll tell you what you need to do. 
It's also using our talents and our gifts, and that's where I think a lot of the doubt comes in. I, God's calling me to step up and to do something, to use my gift and my talent, whatever that is, and I don't think I can do that. I just, I just it scares me. I've failed before. Hmm? I've failed too. Some of you heard some of my early sermons. So. But it can get you to a place where you're just too afraid to try anything. Where you don't venture out of your comfort zone because you're haunted by the times in the past where you've tried and you failed. It's best to just give up than, and accomplish nothing than to be doomed by failure again. Doubt is debilitating and it is a lie from Satan. You do know he's out to get us, right? Okay. Third, uh, the fo- fourth thing that could, can lead into this, and we know what that is, right? Sin. Sin can bring us to a place of, of, of stagnancy. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you turn there or write it down, it's up to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, verse, starting in verse 1, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as People who are worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, you are not worldly, you are acting like mere humans. There's sin in the church. Is there sin in the church? Is there sin in our church? Is there quarreling? God put me this, this, this on my heart to say something. I, I have become aware, from time to time we do, as pastors we hear about things. Sometimes we act on those things and talk to the person if, it's, if there are sins involved. But there's been something that's been in our church and I want to address it. Can I do that? There has been gossip going on within our church. And gossip leads to slander. Now, if I read my Bible right about what, maybe about 50 times in Scripture, it talks about gossip and how damaging that can be. He doesn't have to, Satan doesn't have to send us off into the deepest, darkest sin. He can just get us on that note. That can cause division within the church. It can cause people to leave. It can cause people to doubt. It can cause a lot of damage. I just want to say, if you're involved in gossip... If you're one of those and right now you're swallowing your tongue because why is he saying that? You need to stop. It needs to stop. Please, stop. It is sin. It is wrong. It is damaging. And I would encourage you that if you've been involved in gossip, that you should go to those people that you've talked about and apologize. Bet that's the most humbling thing that you can do. I am sorry. I fell short. I shouldn't have done that. There you go. I throw that out there. When we're giving ourselves over to sin, we can stunt our spiritual growth. Now, let me understand this. Raise your hand if you don't ever sin. Good. We all sin. I sin. Pastor Jim sin. We all sin. We all have times when that 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 old nature raises up. You're driving the car, and those people, man, people have been idiots driving lately. Have you noticed that? And that can get me going, right? And that's a wrong attitude. Sin can be a lot of things, things we put our eyes on, things we listen to. Maybe when it was gossip, you were allowed, you were not only the one speaking, but you were the one listening to it. That's sin as well. We can find ourselves in there. So we all sin and we all fall short, but the key is, is a life of repentance where I go and I go, man, that was wrong. Lord, forgive me. Now, I know that when God died, he, how, much son, how much of my sin did he die for? All of it. My past sin? The, the sin that I had just committed when I asked him to forgive me, and, and here's the hard part for some, if you come from certain denominations, y'all future sin. But because I, I mean, that would be like Dwayne and I. Now, I know Dwayne. I could do anything, and Dwayne will always forgive me. He's told me that, and I just know that. But what kind of a relationship do I have with Dwayne if I wouldn't go to him and say, I am sorry. I, I, I'm sorry that I did that thing with our Lord even more, that we would go to him and say, I'm sorry, that humbles our hearts, that, that keeps it broken and keeps it where it needs to be. But what we're talking about sin here, and, and Paul had started this church many years prior to writing this, but unfortunately they hadn't even progressed past where they were. They were still acting like they were worldly people even though they had met Jesus Christ. They had met Christ. They're stuck in the mud of sin. So here's the problem. It's not when we sin and we fall short and we go to the Lord and we ask him. It's when we start making excuses. 
it's when we start being become very comfortable with the sin that we commit. And I think that makes Satan very happy. Some of you are stuck in a sin right now that you've been excusing. You keep saying, well, but he loves me. <laughs> he loves me. I, it's okay. You know, he knows I, you know, I struggle with that. And we just keep making excuses instead of turning from it. We can turn from it with the power and the strength of God's word. I'm going to ask Pastor John here to, to share something with you. We were talking about uh, this subject uh, this last week, and he came across the study uh, that I, I want him to share with you. John, would you share that? Sure. A uh, study was done a couple of years ago um, about biblical engagement in our lives. So uh, I was just looking at it. Uh, Less than, on average, less than 20% of all professing Christians spend more than one day in their Bible. Um, the study said that of those people that are professing Christians that say they're in the Bible, if they're in their Bible once a week, it had 0% change on their life. Twice a week, 0% change in their life. Three times a week, 0% change in their life. And as I looked at that study, I thought, three t- what's the deal with three? Sunday morning, Wednesday night, men's and women's Bible study, whatever. So most Christians who go to church, on average, unfortunately are not in their Bible. It was un- not until four times or more a week that a person was in their Bible, reading their Bible, actively reading their Bible, that um, they had 57% lower odds of getting drunk, 68% lower odds of sex outside of marriage, lower odds of pornography and 74% lower odds of gambling. That's on the downside. The other side was different. Of the people that read their Bible four times or more a week, or were in their Bible four times or more a week, their odds of sharing their faith with others was 228% higher. Discipling others, 231% higher. Memorizing Scripture, 400% 400% higher. We need to be in our word. Amen. Thank you, John. You want to be changed by God's word? You want to stand against the sin that so easily tangles us up and keeps us from being productive? We've got to be in our, his word. Four times a week. Three of those, if you're involved in a Bible study here in the church, you're already opening up your word then. But I want to just say something, and I'm not asking for a raise of hands, but how many of you have opened your Bible this last week before today? And you know what? It's easy to, (laughs) I got one over there. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, It's easy to fall into that. Even a pastor or a leader in this church can fall in that place where you only go to the Word to prepare with whatever you're going to teach, whatever group you are teaching. We're supposed to be in it on a regular basis. You say, you say to yourself, I'm struggling with sin. I keep getting drugged down by whatever it is. But are you in the word of God on a regular basis? Because we just heard that that gives you the power and the strength that you need to stand against it. Your marriage sucks. Guess what? Somebody's not in the word. I, and I can tell you that because I do counseling in this church. And I know that if two people are driven to the, cro- the foot of the cross by their faith first, both of them, everything's working like it should. I don't ever see those people. Usually I get with people who are like, well, I haven't been, well, I struggle with that, I've had some problems with that, and then they find themselves in sin where sin doesn't bother them anymore. You get bothered by sin because you're in the Word and you see what it says, Right? Instead of feeling conviction, we get to feeling apathy, and then again, we are dead where we stand. There can be other reasons, too, that bring us to a a place where we're we're stagnant. It can be fear or past events, things that have gone on. But I see that God gives every opportunity and tool and resource, and he has it in this church, for you to be able to deal with those things and to be able to stand against them. So if we don't do something about the stagnation in our own life, and right now, after we read that, I'm pretty sure that there are several people going, Oh, crud. Yep, I'm there. 
What can happen? What can happen if we just stay in that stagnant space, right? We gave our life to Jesus. Now we've not done anything with it. What will happen if we stay? Well, back to 2 Peter, it says that we will be unaffected and unproductive. And that is the biggest problem today in the church, I think. What's happening in the world? This world is screwed up and it's getting darker and darker and darker. And if we are not acting effectively in our faith and, and out there doing what we need to do, then we have no effect on the, the society around us. Can't complain when you're not doing what needs to say. When we're, we're in this stagnation, we will not pursue any of those qualities that we read about in Second Peter, which is uh, we're not pursuing goodness. We're not trying to increase our knowledge. We're not exhibiting self-control. There was where the sin comes in. I'm not trying to preserve none of these things. Therefore, I'm not in hot pursuit, and I am ineffective and unproductive. And Satan is smiling. Hmm. Peter even says that in that scripture, did you catch that part where he says, you're nearsighted and blind to the fact that you even have been cleansed from sin? We have forgotten what God did for us that we're in that place. Because uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be focusing on myself, and that's what this is really about. When I put the focus on myself and not on the Lord, then that's a dangerous place to be. Another scripture for you, Titus chapter 3. Titus 3, Titus 3 verse 14 says this, Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for the urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Again, we see it right there. I'm stagnant uh, because I'm not devoting myself to doing good, not devoting myself and putting effort towards those things that will make me effective and productive. And, I'm, and, and if we don't do those things, we will waste away. Okay? Uh, stagnant, rust, decay. When we're doing nothing, keep this in mind, when you are doing nothing with your faith, you are doing something. Something is happening. You're either moving forward or you're moving backward. You're either becoming strong or you're becoming weaker. And so many of you in here, really, I truly do believe that you desire to be stronger Christians. You see other people share their faith and you desire that. Dwayne's got a great big class in there on Sunday mornings talking about evangelism. So I know there are people that desire to be able to share their faith. But when you are doing nothing, then you are wasting away as a Christian. You're being inactive. And it will cause you to rot and decay. And it opens yourself up to Satan. This scripture came up a while back. John and I were talking about something. And, and you, you say, how, well, how far, really? I mean, I believe in once saved, always saved. It's not in scripture. It's not. I mean, I believe as I read scripture that a gift freely given and received by me is also a gift freely returned. It's not scripture. That's just my words. But as I read that, I can come to a place where my heart is so darkened that I just say I don't want it anymore. And I have met those people who do not want it anymore. They have no desire for it. What will happen to them when they die? I don't know. That's between them and God. I don't know the depths of their heart. God does. And we're not going to talk about that because I know some of you right now are going, wait a minute, I have a problem with that. Well, that's a topic for another sermon. But as I see, there are ifs. Pastor Jim even wrote a paper. I don't know if it's out there on the the counter, but we'll get some out there. Conditional statements throughout Scripture when the, the writer is talking to believers and he's saying, if you do these things, then you will receive this. Well, if there's an if, then there's an if that it goes the other way to if you don't. We read an if statement in Second Peter, if you do these things. So if there's an if, so there is no really stop and stay. I'm just hanging out. I got saved. I'm just parked. I'm not really doing anything with my faith. That doesn't exist. We're either moving forward or moving backwards. And this scripture is scary. And that is in, in fact, flip there if you would. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12, verse 43 through 45. I think, I, don't you love it that scripture scares us every once in a while? Makes you go, whoa, I don't want that to happen. More, Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 through 45. And it says, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house that I left, and when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. That is God's cleansing. 
Then it goes and it takes with it this, the spirit that seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go and they live there and the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That's how it will be in this wicked generation. That's scary. And I've seen some people struggling with that. Gave their life to Christ, did nothing to fill it in. Did nothing to add to their understanding. And unfortunately, sometimes that's the fault of the church. Can we say, ouch? We're, it's the fault of the church. We need to be better about discipleship. So when someone comes to faith, we don't just pat them on the back and say, welcome to the kingdom, that we take them into the word of God and we show them how to study and how to grow and how to understand. Don't just say, just come to church, because again, you can sit there and do nothing. We need to invest in those people. We need to be good. We need, Bible says what? First, love the Lord with all your heart. Second, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And third, go and make disciples. And we do that by investing in the people. This man was swept clean. God had come in and cleaned house. Praise the Lord. But then this, and, that, and that's, you know, we sang that song. Thank you, Adrian, for singing that song, Amazing Grace. That, that, that's it right there. But he didn't do anything with it because, and because he didn't progress, he regressed to the place where the spirits came rushing back and, and worse than they were before. Hmm. Lack of action, lack of being renewed by God's word opened the door for that. So if we aren't adamant about replacing the old ways with the new ways, we are in danger. Amen? Another scripture for you. Ready? I love this one. You should put this on your wall. Ecclesiastes 10.18. Ecclesiastes 10.18. It says, if a man is lazy, the rafters sag. If his hands are idle, the house leaks. Got some sagging rafters out there? Is your house leaking? House, we know that a house will fall apart if we don't do what we need to do to a house every once in a while. It needs to be recalked and repainted. My house is in that place right now. I'm trying to get it repainted. Um, and, and if we don't, then the house will be damaged. There will be damage that goes further because we're not keeping it where it needs to be. If we're lazy with our faith, we will deteriorate and waste away just like a house will. If we think we can do nothing to the house, well, you've, you maybe have one of those houses in your neighborhood that's falling apart. Same thing about a marriage. We talk about counseling in, in a marriage. There, all marriages don't end in abuse and infidelity which unfortunately happens far too often in marriages, even in Christian marriages. But they don't all end that way. Sometimes it's just that one spouse does nothing. I mean, we all, okay, let's just admit it. When we get married, guys, we were in much better shape than we were after we got married, right? Amen. Come on. I put on a few pounds. I got comfortable. I found the woman that I love. She's right back there. She feeds me well. Everybody thinks we don't feed her because she's so skinny, but that's not the case. I left her some chicken yesterday. I did. But if we don't do something in our marriages, it can come to a point where it's just there's nothing there. What about your health? I mean, we can, we can do bad things to our body, but we can get sick and have a heart attack just by not doing good upkeep to our bodies. Amen? So the same is true with our faith. If we don't, if we are staying stagnant, we will waste away. You will waste away. If you are stagnant in your faith right now, then in another few weeks, you won't even be here. Hmm. And then we can also lose what we have. And I'm not going to read the scripture, but just please make note of it. It's Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 uh, through 30. And it talks about, I'll give a quick summary here. It talks about the, 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 the man who's going away on a journey and he goes to his servants and he gives them a certain amount of, 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 wealth, of his wealth to do something with while he's gone. And he goes away, and when he comes back, he finds of these three men, the first, the first two did, did a good job. And in that, he rewarded them because they had done good. The third one had just buried it away and done nothing with it which he knew his master, and he knew that his master would not be pleased with, with not doing that. He saw his master uh, uh, get, get things from the wealth that he had even when, when he was away from it, and he did nothing. Hmm. He just buried it. And what did he say to that servant? All the rest, he praised. 
The other two, this one he said, you wicked and lazy servant. I think we're going to change our volunteer applications from volunteer applications to servant applications because that's really what we are. Servants, right? Using our gifts and our talents. In verse 30 of that tree says, and throw that worthless servant outside into darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Ouch. You've heard the phrase, use it or lose it, right? Not scripture. Mm. So I see as I read scripture, there is a chance that if I do not use the gifts and the talents that I have been given, and I stay in that stagnant place, struggling place, understandable, we all go through those. But if I stay in that stagnant place, and I do not use the gifts and the talents that God's given me, I risk losing those talents. You know, people say when I, when I stand up here and I try and encourage people to be involved in ministry and to step up and work in the children's or the youth or whatever, they think, oh, he's just trying to fill spots. And I am trying to fill spots. But what I really want to have happen is for you to find out what your gift, your calling is, because you have a calling. I'm a pastor. I have a calling. You have a calling too. What has God called you to do, and are you doing what he's called you to do? Because I know that when you use your gift and your talent and, for, and, and you do what you're called to do, you are going to be blessed beyond compare. I know there are people in here that have shared with me a testimony that they have, uh, uh, they, I, say, I say, you know, that, that first time that you actually lead someone, how many people in this room have led someone to Christ? You, you get to pray. Is that not the most, that's like Christian crack. That, is that the most energizing thing to sit with someone who was destined for the gates of hell and you just got to be used and guide and direct them a little bit <clears throat> and you, you led them to Christ and now here is this child of the king sitting before you. The same is true with everything that we do. The children, you know, that seems to be one of the hardest areas for us to fill. But you are investing in the future. We've got to look at it in a different light. We've got to say, you know what, I want to be used. I want to, I want to invest in somebody. I want to do something, whether it's there or somewhere else. We, when we ask for volunteers, nothing we do here is frivolous. We don't like that. We don't like frivolous things. Anything that we do or we ask for help with, there's a reason for it. Even the sound booth and those guys back there, do you know how much they keep the flow of service going? that they remove, try and remove distractions for us. They make it easy for us to read the words, to be able to worship. They keep the sound where it needs to be. That's a vital ministry back there, and you're ministering to people when you're back there. Hmm. So if you don't use the talent that God's given you, the, the calling that God's given you, you risk losing it. I don't want to lose my talents, gifts. What's even worse than losing our talents? John 15 Verse 5, John 15, 5 through 8. I'll read it because most of you know it. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Let me read that part again. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Good underline there. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burn. If you remain in me and in and my words and remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is my fa- uh, to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be disciples. There's only one way to become part of the vine, and that's by being his, right? So as part of the vine, if I'm not bearing fruit or good fruit, because I think there's fruit that comes from those who are stagnant. It's just, not, it's just rotten fruit. If I'm, not, if I'm stagnant, I'm not bearing good fruit. If dead branches will not remain in Christ. So if I'm not bearing fruit, and I'm not showing myself to be the disciple that I've been called to be, I risk being cut off. I don't want to do that. Persisting in my stagnation could, again, bring me to that place where I forfeit. So what we've got to do is this. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit. There is hope. Even if you're stagnant, even if everybody in this congregation is watching online is completely dead and they're not doing anything, which I know is not the case. But even if we were in that place, there is hope. If we go to Revelations chapter 3, we're in the section of Revelation where the churches are being addressed, and we come to the church of Sardis in chapter 3 of Revelation, and it says, To the angel of the church of Sardis, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. 
You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Now that would seem like it's a done deal, right? No. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know the time in which I come. See, the church in Sardis had become stagnant in their faith. And, you know, it looked good. Hey, man, did you see how many cars were in the parking lot over at Calvary Chapel Eastside? There are a lot of people there. I mean, yeah, is there the talk out there? But see, but God knows our heart, right? So we can do all of those things, and it can look like a buzz, and we can be busy out there but be dead. They looked alive, but in fact, they were dead. Jesus was there, and I believe he is here today, to motivate us to wake up and, call, and, and, and repent. What is repentance? Repentance means I'm going in a direction, and I realize this is the wrong direction to go, so I turn around and go the other way. How easy is that? Especially when the power for me to, to notice it and to turn is all in God's hands. Amen? So we have an opportunity. It's not, there, is, there is hope for us to change what we're doing. But we need a sense of urgency inside of us to see these things and, and, and to act upon them. It's like if the doctor tells you if you don't stop smoking, you're going to die. I mean, the, the smart person would say, well, then I need to stop smoking. Amen? I need to, to do what I need to do so that I don't die. I need to take action. And if need be... God will, he'll discipline us. I'm not going to read this either. Hebrews chapter 12 and, and 8 through 13 in there. You can read that whole chapter there. But it talks about uh, being God's discipline. And in verse 12, it calls that we, says that we have feeble arms and weak knees because we have not exercised spiritually those parts of us. So, so when God disciplines, and maybe he's disciplining you right now, I'm thankful that God lets garbage come my way once in a while. Does that sound weird? I'm thankful that there are difficult times that come my way because I know that God could stop any one of those things if he wanted to, but he allows it to come my way so that I will be drawn back to him. Has that happened with you lately? Who among us today has feeble arms and weak knees? Who is spiritually lame and disabled? We need to respond to God's Spirit who's trying to wake us up. Sometimes God will use other people. I think we're kind of good at this, actually. Uh, I, we do have some very dedicated people. Uh, I think that a church is best when it lives transparently in front of one another, and we share our difficulties, our struggles, and things like that, maybe with your ministry leader, your small group, or someone that you feel closest to. I'm, I'm thankful for that because God does use people to spur us on, and I, I, I know that may be not the word to use. I get the idea of that, you know, the cowboy with the spurs on the side, the dig in a little bit. Hey, come on, wake up. You're going in the wrong direction. If you have people that are doing that with you, receive it. Especially if you've, re if you've reached out and you found godly people who are sharing that with you. It isn't always going to be me. It's not. Our pastors, we, we're very careful that if sometimes there's situations going on I've not been a part of. And because I've not been a part of it, I'm not going to get involved in it. I'm here, but I'm not going to jump in there. Sometimes it's somebody else that's supposed to, to jump in there and say something. So, so do that, please. Be that kind of person. When God's using someone to highlight and address my stagnation, I need to take heart and respond to what I'm hearing from them. If I'm going from stagnation to being more stimulated in my walk, I first need to be woken up. And then I need to be renewed. And I love this next piece of scripture. It's in Psalms 51, 10 through 12. I think that this should be your prayer. If you are found in that place right now, that you would visit this. And as you spend time talking to the Lord, that you do the same that David did. Psalm 51, verse 10 says, Create in me a pure heart, O Lord, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Right there, man. That's it, right there. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of my salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain it. See, everything we've read before this shows that we do things that take us, that we, where we've forgotten what God did for us. 
Can you remember that day when you gave your life to Christ? Can you? I can. I know I've shared it with you before, but I'm going to do it again. John's watching me. He's saying, man, you're talking too long. But I was in Nebraska, which right there, that's hell. I mean, pretty much, if you've been there. And I had gone to a conference of some kind. I don't even remember what it was, but it was at a church quite a ways away, and I got to ride with a girl. I took her. Yeah, it wasn't her. It was, it was somebody else, and a good friend. And we went, and I sat in this old movie theater that had the little flip-up seats. I remember that I picture it. And, and, and we were sitting there. The, the, the speaker got done. I can't even remember what he preached about, to be honest. And I was sitting in that seat, and my pastor was sitting down a few rows, and we started singing that song, It Is Well With My Soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And it was not well with my soul. My pastor stood up, and he came back. To the row in front of me, there was nobody in it, and he walked up to me, and he turned to shake my hand, and he said, do you want to know Jesus? And I just broke down. Yes, yes, I want to know Jesus. And that's where he saved me, and I can remember that. Can you remember when you were saved? Can you remember that, when, that go back to that joy of your salvation when God rescued you from the pit of hell? Can you remember that? Because that's what David was crying after, renewing that in me, Lord. I want to remember that, and that's what I want to live off of and act I want my heart to be right. Thomas Jefferson wrote, when the heart is right, the feet are swift. I love that. When the heart is right, the feet are swift. Where my heart lies is going to what drive me to, to run this race before me. We need to re have this renewal and that's this sense of purpose. We need to understand that God has got a purpose for everyone in this place. God's purpose is not always comfortable, I will tell you. Our baptism, we got saved, we wanted to be baptized, which you'll notice this is up here, and I have the most amazing story to share with you. You're going to get to experience that in a bit. But sometimes we did that, and that's as far as we went. I'm saved, look at me, and that was it. We didn't put anything else into it. So we are called to be, from that point forward, to be Christ-like, amen? And, and that's going to take all of my life. I don't know about yours. So I'm gonna, it's it's going to take every bit of all that I have until God takes me home to try and be Christ-like. So if we look at it from that perspective, then throughout our life, there's always something we can improve something. There will always be, we will be able to improve something. There's always someone to help. There's always work to be done in the kingdom of God. We need to be compelled. We need to get busy for Jesus. Amen. And we see that he was um, compelled. We are in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It, it talks about us being, there's that scripture towards the end that says that we are called to be ambassadors for Christ. That's from 14 to 21. We're called to be ambassadors, a representative for Jesus Christ. Amen? We need to be compelled to be proper ambassadors. We need to be a correct representation of Jesus. We need to be compelled to fulfill our calling as ministers of reconciliation. We need to be compelled to fulfill our calling as Christians, which every one of us has. In Matthew chapter 9, at the end of that, on verse 37, he says to the disciples that statement that we need to hear this morning, and that is the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And even then, he said, guys, ask the Lord of harvest, therefore, to send more workers into the harvest field. You see, we would say this. I'll, I'll try this here. Let's go for this. How many of you believe that Christ's return is quite near? I mean, how many want it to be near? I do. With what's going on in the world and the direction that's going, we all say amen. We all say that his second coming is near. We drive past that sign every week as we leave this parking lot that says, welcome to the mission field. We are all called. We know we are called to serve him and to be good ministers and to be out there. The, the problem is, is there are millions of people who need Jesus. There, there are millions who are harassed by Satan and are helpless because they have not been shown the way. 
the Bible has gotten so pushed out of society anymore. There's people that just don't, I believe there's people that just don't know that there's a, a Lord and a Savior that died for them. And it's our responsibility to tell them. Millions are sick and deceased by sin, diseased by sin. Hmm. So Jesus is telling his disciples there that, to pray that more are willing to go to the harvest. Millions are dying in their sin. We need to have more passion. We need to get out of our comfort zone. Can we do that? Jesus gave us the Great Commission again for us all to do. And why do I think that that Great Commission is for everybody else, but it's not for me? And I've been there myself. Yeah, that's people more gifted to do that. Not for me. Hmm. I might need to ask myself, why aren't I compelled by the love of the Christ to do what he's calling me to do? Why am I not compelled? What's getting in the way? What's getting in the way for you? What's stopping you from doing the things that you know are the right thing? What's stopping you from making a difference in this lost and dying world? Ed, Ed, Edward, Edmund Burke, there you go, said this statement, and you all know it, all that is necessary for tri the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. We see it going on around us, and if we don't do something, if, we don't, if we're not active with what the area of influence that we have, then evil will triumph. If we don't move out of this stagnant situation. As a church and as individuals, because we're responsible to one another, we're a big family here, we need to encourage one another. If we don't move out of that, then evil will win. So I'm about ready to close things up here. We're like, good. Someone once said, some people stand on the promises and others just sit on the premises. I'll read it again. Some people stand on the promises of God. Some just sit on the premises. And that's where I started this out. Some just come. It's what I do. It's what you do on Sunday, right? You just go to church. But then I go home and nothing changes. Like maybe come on Wednesday nights and I go home and nothing changes. I go to my Bible study and, I, and then I go home and nothing changes. Something has to change. We've got to be moved beyond the chair sitters. We've got to become active in our faith. And I'll tell you what, if you do the visions and the dreams that I have been given, it is amazing what this church can do. But you must step up. And I can't make you. I'm here to hope, help you. We're help, here to help hold, your, help hold you up if you're struggling. If we're not out there trying, uh, rolling up our sleeves and bringing in this harvest of those around us, then we're just sitting back and we're watching someone else do it. And you are missing out. We need to get off the bench, get in the game. God's calling Calvary Chapel Eastside to come back to that living, flowing, fresh water. I think that's in Kings, isn't it, where it talks about this, that we have, uh, we've, we've chosen and, and allowed ourselves to, to drink from the stagnant cistern of water, and we need to come out of that ever-flowing spring again. And he's there. He's ready to do it for you. It's easy. Just go, Father, I'm sorry. I've not walked in that way. And you go home, and you start putting together a plan that you're going to start investing in knowing your word. And then go into God and talking to him. Find your place that you go talk to him. I love to go for walks late in the evening, and I walk throughout about this four and a half as you've seen, I haven't done it lately. But I have about the four and a half mile stretch that I go, and the Lord and I have great conversation. It's in dark, and there's nothing else going on, and I get to talk to him, and he shares with me what he wants from me, and it's just, oh, it's just an amazing place to be. Let's move beyond stagnation and become, let's go make a difference. Can we, let's, can we do that? So something happened Wednesday that just really blessed me. Uh, we were just about ready to come into service, and a young man uh, stepped in. I'm going to try and do it right. Kamari? Got it. Okay. Kamari stepped in the door with a little protective shiny vest on from coming from work. He was riding his bicycle back, and something told him to stop. And Kamari came up to Dwayne and I and said, do you believe in water baptism as a church? I said, well, yes, we do. And I said, but what do you think it is? Because some people think it saves. Some people think it does a lot of things. And Kamari told me that this is, this is an outward expression of what's already happened inside of me. And then I asked him about what happened inside of him. I'm going to have him share that. But Kamari, come on up here. We're going to baptize Kamari today. Kamari asked, he said, 
Come over here. This way. You can go around the other end. There's some stairs up there. Kamari said, I need to be baptized as soon as possible. We're going to do it. So we're going to do it right now. And before he starts, I want to say this. This is an expression, an outward expression of what's happened in him already. And maybe somebody's sitting here today and you're convicted and you're saying, you know what? I've gone back to the old ways. What? Oh, yeah, oh, I'm, I, I don't slow down. I, I, I have lots to say. Come on in and step in there. Maybe you're going to say, you know what? I need to renew that too. I need to share with everybody that I am that. And maybe I've grown stagnant. It doesn't matter. Guess what? You are uh, going to get wet. We have towels. You'll dry off on the way home. Take your cell phone out of your pocket. Take your wallet out. And if that's something that you need to renew, then renew it today. But if not, we're going to just do Kamari. And Kamari's going to share with you just a little bit. Tell me. Tell us. So I gave my life to Jesus Christ about two years ago. The first time I opened up a Bible, truly, I thought it was a prank. It hit me so deeply and so personally. I had to check multiple sources, multiple Bibles online. And then I realized, like, this is really in the Bible. This was really here before me. And this is really speaking to me. So throughout my walk, we've all stumbled. We all fall short. But throughout that entire time, I made sure I had a relationship with God. I continued to pray, keep him in my life through everything. And God finally showed me that unconditional love is with him. There's no need for anything Amen. else outside of you Amen. for you to feel whole. And I'm extremely grateful as I continue my walk. I'm just, every day, I feel more and more blessed. Man, thank you, man. Oh, yeah, that's right. This is Pastor Jim. He's going to baptize you. Anybody else? Anybody else want to get baptized? It's okay if you don't. You want to get baptized? Come on up, brother. We got towels. Come on up. Take his boots off first, man. Man can. Remind us your name or tell everybody because they may not know you. You're fairly new here too. Yeah, my name's uh, my name's Neil. If I haven't met you yet, I will. Um, grew up in a biblical household. Uh, had biblical knowledge all my life. My father was an ordained pastor for Beat Creek Baptist Church in uh, Branson, Missouri. I was baptized once, I think at 11 years old, before I had any idea of what it actually meant. And so, um, yeah, I'd just like to renew that today. I, uh, it wasn't until 2018 that something, something happened. Um, I always knew about Jesus, but in 2018, I just felt the draw. I was watching sermons and in my Bible, and just my entire past had been illuminated to me. And it was nothing but filth, guys. Um, it was nothing but sin. And... Uh, 
just something amazing happened. I fell on my knees. I cried. I prayed that night, and he gave me a new heart. Amen. And he restored me. Amen. And about a year later, I fell pretty hard, guys, and I spent, I spent maybe four years in the wilderness. And listen, I want to be careful with my language here because I know there were some children in the audience. But if you're a guy in this room tonight and you're struggling with something that's so easily available on the Internet through your yep. phone or your Preach PC. It. Preach it. Okay, listen, don't leave here today. In a room this size, I know there's at least one or two. Don't leave here today without letting me pray for you, okay? Flee from that stuff and accept the forgiveness that's here for Amen. you. Amen. I love you guys. Thank you. Amen. Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior. All right. So you understand when you go down, you're going to come up fresh and new in Christ. Amen. All right. Focus him on Jesus. That's what you do. Father, we baptize him in the name of the Father and then the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Woo! <laughs> God bless. Amen, man. You rock, buddy. You rock. We got another one over here, I think. Somebody else getting baptized? Come on up, brother. going to share a little bit. Dennis has recently fell on hard times. I'm going to let you know. God has not forsaken him. Amen. Nor has he forsaken you. Amen. He loves you. All right. Dennis, I know you received Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, right? Do you believe that all things work together for those that will love God and call according to his purpose? All right, so God has you right where he wants you. And I know you've received Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. Is that correct? So his declaration of faith is in Christ. This water baptism isn't just so you get wet. So you can be renewed. That you can come up a new man. It's your dedication to Christ that saves you. Not getting wet. Amen? Amen. So we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So, uh, I don't know if you're noticing something, but these three men are fairly new to our fellowship. But is there someone that's been sitting here for a long time? Maybe you've been in this baptismal before, but you've allowed things to just, they're not so good. And you need to get back on top of things. Better, better now that you make a public profession in front of us right here where we're your family and we're here to support you. Is there someone else? We're going to be doing another baptism service down the line. There's been some people that have asked about their children and things like that, but opportunities right here. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a little bit of worship time here. Elders will come up here. We're here to pray with you. Maybe you just need some prayer to this morning. Maybe just that's all you need. You don't want to get baptized again, but you just need some prayer to continue forward as God has laid it out for you. Guys, the visions and the dreams that God has given me for this church, we are going to shake up this part of the city. But it can only happen when everyone within this part of this congregation here comes alive in their faith. Amen? So now's the time. Get it right so when we leave here today, we are all on task. We are all focused, and we are all going to be serving him with all our heart, and then God's going to do things. Uh-oh, we got another one. Woo-hoo! Amen. This is what it's about. Family coming together. We're all family. Amen. You got the towel ready? Okay. All right. I'm going to 
have you share just a little bit now that you're wet. Sorry. Uh, I grew up in the church, too, and I've been baptized when I was nine, so, but I came back to the Lord a while ago, but it's something that always just was, you need to get baptized again. Amen. So you believe Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Yes. Amen. Can you give us your name? Samantha. Samantha. Amen. Samantha. So all Amen. these people you see here today, I want you praying for this week. Amen. 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 Keep them lifted up. <laughs> it seems to be catching. Anybody else? Yeah. The dry out. This is awesome. We're going to have them sing a song of praise. The baptismal is still open. These guys are going to hang there. We're up here to pray with you. Let's see what God has to do today. Amen. Let's all stand together, shall we? It's a time of surrender. Baptism is a picture of that surrender. You can surrender right where you're at. We would love to baptize you, but it's only a picture of something that has already happened in your heart. Give your heart and your life to Jesus Christ this morning. Renew your vows to him. If there is any stagnancy, any lukewarmness, repent of it this morning. Be done with it. Worship the Lord in spirit and in truth by giving him all of your heart and renewing your vows to him this morning. It's your opportunity. In Jesus' name, let's sing, Pops. <laughs> 